Welcome to Nerd Chat Week 13. Uh, got the same old crew with us. Uh, does anybody want to start off what they've been up to? You, since yeah. you're always last. I am always last, but I, I don't mind that. Um, not much. I mean, well, I can't, I would like to say not much, but really there's a, there's been a lot going on. I, I don't seem to have any free time just with uh, my regular full-time job as an electrician still, and then working with a uh, black bot on my off hours. But what was cool is yesterday I actually got to attend a cyber threat course, like an in-person course, believe it or not, they still do those. Uh, and it was hosted by SoCal, uh, SoCal Off-Grid and Shellator. It was cool, man. Uh, we covered a lot of the basic stuff of like operational security as far as uh, just staying safe, make sure you have long, strong passwords and, and stuff like that, you know, like online hygiene and that kind of stuff. And then- What is online hiding? Online hygiene. hygiene. Yeah. So like making sure that you're, you're either using plugins you know, that you're, uh, you're not saving all your passwords and all your browsers and stuff like that. And what would have to make you do that? Or typing in your name and every, uh, and everything that asks that? your name. <laughs> how can you mitigate that? What can you do to put it in place? I use password managers as far as the pa password thing. So I use, so if you ask me what my password is, I, I honestly couldn't tell you because I have no idea because it's like 25 characters of all sorts of random yeah, things. Yeah, auto generate. But, but I'm saying, like, okay, so what is the password manager just for those out there? Oh, so I could take this. Chime in, Jay. I, I know you love this one. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. This is my specialty. But now don't consider a password manager a password manager. Consider it like the entire internet manager because you could put fake answers for your security questions you could put fake names you could put fake everything and really what you should do is ask yourself when i sign up to this site is it illegal to put fake information and do they need it you know even if you get something shipped as you know like you don't need to put your actual last name if you put the address and there's sites like a non-addy which is you don't even have to give them an email you could just give them a, a fake subdomain that send them then forwards to your real email and that's really like where the the i don't know internet hygiene comes in is you know can I put fake information? Is it illegal if I do, which 99% of the time it's not past phrases instead of passwords and not things like lyrics to a song, but like a sentence that maybe you'll remember that's super unique and just, I mean, false information when you can do that, that's really what you can do. Yeah, another thing I like, uh, if you ever use privacy.com, it's basically a way you can set up virtual uh, credit cards. So if you know, hey, I'm only spending like 100 bucks on something, it generates a credit card number that you can use for that purchase. You can set a cap on it. So then if those uh, you know, credentials get leaked or that information gets out there, they can't you know, charge more than is on the card. It also works good if you need to you know, make some uh, interesting purchases that you don't want to have on your actual debit card. Cool. Yeah, so Chase offers that too, so... So when you're saying like leaked out there, when people get their email pond and stuff like that, what is that? What does that mean? Breaches, leaks, depends. Companies either, you know, hacked externally and then that's leaked online or they leave something often misconfigured like a elastic DB or elastic search and, and that, that's found by a researcher and then either sold or, or you know, just put on online publicly for fun. So what kind of tools can you do to, to generate that information like how can i go out and get them how can i prevent it so say how can i go out there right now and say okay is my email leak or is my credit card leak like um you can I always go on, have i been pwned.com and so have i been pwned.com will pretty much announce all of the the known leaks and all the known breaches and you type in your email and if your email has been part of one of the known breaches, then it'll show you like where it's been breached, what information was breached, whether it's your address, your passwords, and stuff like that, username. And it's funny that we were talking about that because that's another reason why not only should you have long, strong passwords, but you have to regularly change them because what people do is they get these, these word lists together, right? They get all these uh, passwords that have been leaked in these breaches. They put them in a word list. And if they're trying to get into your account, they just start putting those hashes against either all these passwords or whatever. And, and if your password is in there and you haven't changed it, then they're going to get into your account, right? It's actually a super cool uh, tour site that I use uh, with a tool called Karma. And that lets me search by the domain. So like at whatever, like at Gainsec, I could look, 
I could search by password and find other emails that have been leaked with the same password, or I could search by username, all those separately. So like, even if it's just your email, I could still search by your password. And if your password is the same on other emails, it might come back. And now I have you across multiple accounts, which is super sweet. Mm -hmm. Right. Also, you can go to hacker forums, like raid forums, mm -hmm. and just download the breaches themselves. So like I have not just from, from raid forums or hack forums or whatever, but I have a good collection, a few billion username and password combinations. So if you ever want me to check if yours is in my collection, you let me know. <laughs> and it's funny that you say that. Um, I had an old, old, you know, when MySpace was a uh, hot new commodity. Mm. I Date I had, now. It's so funny because I had- Yeah, hey, I had one. And I had an email address. It was like Gorman60, I don't remember what the fuck it was. But like something at hotmail.com, right? And I, and I had, it was funny because the other day, my daughter's mom was like, sister was like, oh, I want to get my like, graduation pictures, right? From, from college. And I remember I had it on my Facebook. I didn't have Facebook back then, but like um, MySpace. And there's a way, I, like I, I queried my, that email, because I don't remember the password, so I, I didn't know. And there's a, there's tools out there um, there's a uh, have it have it safe and I, I just like put you know it's a, it's a python script and I just like put my email address and it goes out and gives me what what the, what the passwords were what emails they were associated with like for example myspace.com was Roman 64 that hotmail.com and it gave me the password that was generated I guess it, was, it got pawned many many moons ago mm -hmm. and I just, you know it, it, I'll tell you the password it was like Nike Skater 85, because I, I love my Nikes and Skater 85, that's a year I was going, but I was like, okay, fair enough, like, and I didn't remember, because I'm like, fuck, I haven't skated in God knows how long, I mean, I don't remember, now I'm putting my like Nike Skater, but I was like, shit, I totally forgot all about that password, and I was able to get into my, that's it's good. my, my yeah. MySpace account, but it was, uh, then I changed the password, yeah. you know, and use Nike Skater. Anymore, which, yeah. is, which is uh, one of the other advantages with those password managers, because when you're using a random character syntax, then it's harder to create a word list where, like as a penetration tester, if we're going after a company, a lot of times we'll use uh, a program like Cool, uh, C-E-W-L, which is a word list creator, and we'll scrape their website. Because a lot of people, when you work for a company, let's say it's like ABC industry, you might have like ABC in the password. And so mm -hmm. we'll assemble a list with just different words or product specific things or common local sports teams because a lot of people sure. will use those in there winter 2020 yeah wow. yeah. yeah it's crazy the cool tool is actually really easy to use right you just type in a url and it just creates the word list yeah, you can use it with just about anything, um, but you can also set parameters like you can make a list of like just six character to eight character passwords. That way you're not ending up with too much data. Um, right. Because if you're throwing too many requests, sometimes it's better to tailor it. But a lot of times um, we'll use that not only for word lists for passwords, but even for like Wi-Fi passwords. Because when you're cracking Wi-Fi, you're just when it creates the actual password for WPA2, it's using the SSID plus the password to kind of create that handshake. Uh, so you can use those to, you know, if you know, hey, I'm going to go test this company, I'll make a rainbow table ahead of time of like a billion different possible combinations. So once I get that four-way handshake of someone connecting, I can just compare that. It's significantly faster. And I want to ask you, J Jacob, like, I know you got the OSCW, right? Like you have the Wi-Fi. Uh, yeah, the OSWP. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and how was that? I want to always ask you about it, but I always... the, the test was a little bit dated, but uh, it was still pretty applicable. It's a little different than most of their uh, tests because you only get like two and a half hours to break into three wireless networks. And they put you in a pretty target rich environment. There's like 40 different wireless access points. So you have to be very careful with your commands because if you start like de opting another network around them, um, then you end up getting kicked offline. And the other challenge is it's, it's a little harder to study for because not like the OSCP where you can't just download a VM. You have to actually have some tools to practice. And when you take the test, you're SSHing into another box you don't control. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, it, it, there's um, the, the way I actually studied for it was basically SSHing into a Raspberry Pi that I had set up 
so I could, you know, simulate and get used mm -hmm. to using the wireless attacks over SSH and dealing with, oh, if I got disconnected, I can jump back in. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I try to create my uh, testing environment to mirror their testing environment as close as possible. So, like, you don't get to use TMUX or anything like that. There's gotcha. Actually, I think it's like a Backtrack uh, 5 R2 um, mm -hmm. ISO on their system. So, like, the the closest tool you have is screen True, or yeah. you can do multiple SSH connections. So I, I basically just practice for, you know, like what happens if I lose a connection or the internet goes down, how can I make sure I can get back in and keep running through? So gotcha. I think it's a good test overall. So it's not 20 hours, hours, it's two and a half hours. Yeah. Was it a lot of the air crack suite or? Yeah, it's all air crack. So it's it's all manual. There, like okay. when I took the test, there was like a WEP and then like a couple WPA2 that you had to crack. A WEP? Yep. Which, that's, a, uh, that's a throwback. Yeah, you'd be surprised how often um, we still find it, even like especially um, industrial control units, like uh, power of stations, course, yeah. things like that. Yeah, like they're they're I mean, still a lot even of city blocks. There. Yep. City blocks, you'll still find them once in a while. And, and some wireless access points you can force to downgrade too. Um, but yeah, it, it just depends on how crappy the setup is. Is that because they just haven't got like gotten around to upgrading their infrastructure? Or? Yeah, or the, you know, somebody just a lot of times you'll see like, oh, we needed to get a, a extended segment, and rather than run a cable, they like pull a switch out of a closet and just plug it in. <laughs> so we'll see that a lot of wireless assessments where someone plugs in a router and they don't realize it's it's got a wireless open network on it, and you just you know expose your entire company behind the firewall. Yeah. So yeah, yeah or like so so if someone wanted to go ahead and go implement some wireless stuff, like do you go and use heat map software to actually see, okay, where the main coverages are, how would you go about assessing a wireless implementation? Yeah, so usually we'll walk, um, you know, we'll get an uh, idea like from the customer, what, what are your SSIDs? And then we'll, we'll do a physical walk to see how far out they bleed, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, both if it's a multi-floor building, we want to see how far up or down it can go and then mm -hmm. how far out it propagates. And then from there, um, we start looking for like rogue access points where uh, I have an application that sends traffic pings out and then looks for them coming from the wireless. So that way you can tell if someone plugged in a wireless access point because you're seeing this traffic basically looking for you. Gotcha. Fair enough. James, what's behind you? Is that, that Cisco gear? It's fucking dust? Uh, so this one's actually a printer. Oh. Underneath it is all of my Cisco gear. So you're trying to hide it. So you. <laughs> no, uh, I was actually thinking because I was uh, I was getting like a list together of all the stuff that I had, and I was thinking about selling on an eBay. But I was like, I like it took me a long time to get like all this specific gear for the CCNA course that uh, is on CBT Nuggets. So I was like, why don't I just like put it together? And, and do like a, a giveaway or something for someone that's really studying for the CCNA, you know? Yeah, and, or you can just keep it and just keep going with, like, if you, I don't know what the route you want to go, but you, if you even go CCNA, CCMP, CCMP security, any kind of route, you can still use that physical gear. Right, yeah. I, I mean, I got everything together, like down to every little detail of the power over ethernet when I couldn't get my Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so everything works now. So it is- and It is to have, and, and yeah. like, I don't know. I'm a big believer. You know, I have GNS3, I have EVNG, and all these different things. Like when I'm doing my CCMP security, I have all the FTWs, FTCs, and all that stuff like Firepower Threat Defense, uh, Firepower Threat Defense Manager. This is all how you um, deploy all the um, configs for your new firewalls. It's not like the ASA. The ASA is used, which is called ASDM. ASDM is the manager that you deploy and get configured for the typical um, Cisco ASA firewalls, but the FTD is so different. Then you use uh, like um, uh, CDA or uh, Cisco device manager, something I forget exactly what the name is, but it's, it's so different than, um, but I think having my point being is like, if you have the physical gear, I think it's so much better to actually, when you're studying then you can automate, you can use Puppet, you can use, you know, Ansible and all these kind of applications to send you those REST APIs and deploy that. Um, but obviously, I'll leave that offline, you know, because that part of CBT Nuggets is, um, yeah, but, but. I think uh, one thing you could do with that, James, uh, you could, um, you know, find like a local hacker space and like, um, you know, lend it to them to set up a lab where other people that may not be able to afford the equipment can come and train on it. 
that would be really cool. Yeah, you could do that. That would be way cool. And even you can do security stuff like VLAN hopping. There's a whole bunch of little things. Mac no, there's like, like the learning of capabilities on a Cisco lab are insane. And yeah, just like you were cool. saying, like if I want to just like go like next level, like CCMP and stuff like that, I could just buy like the firewalls and just add it on top of this setup already. So yeah, it's like I, I would get some shelves because I don't want you to get like, you know, killed in an avalanche of IT equipment. <laughs> I know, there's so many, dude. <laughs> yeah. That's like the one thing I was thinking is like, man, if I do end up selling this online, I have to pay like $120 for shipping, like all this stack of machines. So or you can try to do it on like offer up or one of those local things like um, Yeah. Like I don't know. Offer up, dude, everyone just low balls. I'm not about offer up. <laughs> yeah, I haven't used that. I had an incident. Um, I don't know how much I can explain online, but maybe we can talk about this offline. But on Craigslist many years ago. And after that, I like, had uh, no more. Uh, yeah. I don't fuck with that online stuff. Yeah, some... I made I made friends with a, a Craigslist scammer once, like from <laughs> Nigeria. Literally the classic. I was just like, dude, I know you're trying to scam me. Where are you from? Like what it was what's your story? And and then he was just like, Do you know where I can convert PayPal to like uh, gift cards? So I like Googled it for him because I guess Google wasn't working or something and we were boys. <laughs> <Inside>. <laughs> yeah it's yeah. crazy i remember yeah, when no, Craigslist that's... was good like i remember like when i was living you know about 12 years ago just when i moved down like two years after i moved down like i got my furniture from like the when i was in college all this stuff like i got on Craigslist, it was good and then i don't know when it like transpired to like people robbing people yeah. people trying to do some craziness i'm like it's gotten so bad over in uh, in our area that they set up like uh, little meat stations right at the police department. So that's yeah. really good uh, red flag. Oh, really? Like if you're not even willing to meet right outside the cop's place, uh, yeah, I'm not driving to your oh. house. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Those are in Florida, so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> hey, I'm just <laughs> extraordinarily happy it's not Florida in the news this time with all the uh, other chaos. It's always Florida. Yeah, right. This time we get a nice break. Like it's sad that the most normal thing that's happened this year was a hurricane coming right at my house. Like, you know, nice. Yeah. Uh, so how was that? It was pretty good. We we ended up getting a lot of wind. Um, I had a small tree in my backyard fall over, but nothing you know too major. It 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 was scary there for a minute, but then it died pretty quick. So. Yeah, I think there's another one out there right now over Nicaragua. Yeah, that, this season's been insane. Yeah. This thing is making like it's going like this and like this. Yeah. And, um, well, there's a hear, I think like Bill Gates is controlling some hurricanes. They were like saying some stuff like that. You know, anybody that's in those conspiracy theories, I invite to become a pro an IT project manager. Like, you know, oh yeah, the vote was rigged. Okay, you got thousands of different voting systems. Like, have you ever tried to coordinate people? I've been doing some of this stuff at work and like, I don't know how project managers do it. Like anybody out there who has a PMP, like more power to you. Because it's, you know, the old phrase, they say it's like herding cats. And that's like mm -hmm. the closest thing I could, you know, come to an analogy. You're always waiting on somebody. The, the emails are coming too late. The project always gets pushed too far. Like if you did rig anything or you could control the weather, the amount of people it would take to do that, you know, like, yeah, you should be running for president. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they will next, uh, next election. I, I can't even get people to return emails so that we can clear funding for their projects. Like, you know, it's, it's not like we're trying to do anything bad. Like just say yes. So I can give you money so you can do this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's <laughs> still, it's still <laughs> yeah. Oh. yeah. It's crazy. But yeah, so back to uh, some of the online hygiene. Well, it, so it was like operational security. It wasn't necessarily just online hygiene. So it was down to like, like if you're using wireless cameras, someone can come in with a deauthor and turn all your stuff off, right? But that's just like the cool way to do it. Like if they really wanted to get into your house, they'll just go to your breaker box and turn off all your power, you know? <laughs> so it's like where where you keep where's your panel? Are you locking it? You know, and, and that sort of stuff. So it was there, cool. There, there's a good talk on that with like the little fire keys that they have uh, for the. Um... Uh, fire department to get into buildings there's like a lock box on the outside and somebody at defcon found out like hey you know if you look a lot of the areas they all use the same key so if you order one of those boxes to put on your building you could get a copy of the key and then you just go around everywhere in your municipality it's like oh i can unlock it and it's got <laughs> usually a set of the building keys and a copy of the alarm code and he's like yeah this is kind of a big security risk but wait what does it unlock exactly 
so it's like a little box on the outside of the building where if i'm like a firefighter oh. i have a special key that i'm supposed to be able to come in unlock the box yeah i know exactly um, what you're saying yeah i can't remember the name there's like a special name for it but i'll post uh when you guys throw this online i'll throw the uh defcon talk in there because it's really good they, they ended up like figuring out how to 3d print a key that would work and you know exposing that this key was reused in multiple locations around like an entire state like if you had this one key you could get into this lockbox for any building in the state so it's nice. pretty wicked that's pretty it is <laughs> it's that type of in stuff the, in the right about. hands i guess yeah, exactly <laughs> well it make it makes sense you don't want to have a firefighter with like 30 keys fumbling around but there there's probably more secure ways they could come up with to do it and he he does make some suggestions in his, the talk as well so it was a good one the whole thing with convenience, man. Mm -hmm. The more convenient it is, the less secure. See, si, senor, that's correct. All right, Jacob. So, uh, what's up with this PC build? We got a little bit of time left. Okay. Uh, yeah. No, I was just um, finally upgrading. I don't like to buy things. I usually reuse or find things to recycle. So, my, my uh, desktop computer was getting up in age. It was an original uh, generation one i7 processor. So, it's been dying when I try to do like. Chrome and Zoom and a VM at the same time. So finally did an upgrade. Uh, tried to keep it under like $1,000 just uh, to have a nice little budget because uh, most of my money's going into home improvement projects since I'm trapped here. So yeah, came out pretty good. Uh, it's uh, up and running. I just got to now install my uh, OS and get everything moved over. So you know how that goes. Yeah. What are you throwing on it? I'm probably going to use Pop. Uh, I've been using that a lot. Um, Pop OS by System76. Um, I, I really like What's it. It's, been, it's it's like a Linux distribution. So which backend? Uh, it's based off of Ubuntu and Debian, but nah, uh, they they okay. made they've made some um yeah adjustments. So if you go to System seventy six, they're a company uh, in America in Colorado, and they create um, custom laptops and desktops that are uh, all assembled here, and they have their own uh, OS distribution. But huh. I, yeah, mm. POP. Yeah. Uh, and, I really like it. It's um, the the hotkeys are very easy to use. It's very programmer centric, and uh, also when I put on my uh, laptop with a Nvidia card, I ended up getting like two extra hours of battery life just because their drivers are much more efficient. So, nice. well, in comparison to like Vanilla nice. De Debian, but I like them a lot, and they're also one of the few that does full disk encryption by default when you set it up. So they're they're really pushing that you know next. Uh, so yeah, which one are you running? Pop OS 20.10 or 20.4 LTS? Depends. I have one on, uh, I have a couple different laptops. I have one just for CTFs and I have a daily driver. Um, so gotcha. I have one running each. So one thing. You want to know about antivirus, right, James? Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I was about to say, Jay. <laughs> Let's hear it. How, how, come, uh, how come my antivirus isn't isn't worth my money. I mean, there's two types. There's runtime antivirus and scan time antivirus. Okay. So like runtime is like something like a uh, malware bytes or scan time is like malware bytes, right? Where you have to manually hit, okay, I want to scan for viruses now or malware or whatever. And then there's runtime, which is like your Avast antivirus or whatever that's called. And the thing with runtime is it's constantly running. So it takes up more resources than it's actually worth. And that's why it's really not worth running. And it's not worth your money. If you're concerned, put malware bytes on your computer, run that once a week, once a day, once a month, however you want to do it. But like that is enough for you to be like, okay, this isn't, this isn't good. You know, something's wrong. I have a pop-up, my computer's slow. Let me run it compared to like, if you're just like clicking everything and downloading a bunch of random stuff, then you maybe could, you know, benefit from like a, a runtime one, like a one that's constantly running, constantly scanning, constantly taking up computer resources but otherwise it's just it's just a waste and it ends up doing more damage than it's worth in my opinion i don't know if anyone else wants to chime in but i don't know i don't use antivirus <laughs> yeah i mean there's no <laughs> i don't use it you don't like slowing down your computer no uh, no i mean malware bytes is good cc cleaner malware bytes run that once a month dude you're good Windows Defender has been doing a really good job yeah. up until the last few iterations. But the, yeah, the other side with that too, now a lot of them are getting away from SHA-1, which is like they'll hash a file to compare it to their known signatures. Now they're going to SHA-256, which, you know, if you have a legacy system is going to just spin your uh, CPU fan all day while it's well, trying to compute all that. 
defender got a uh, like combined with uh, oh god what is it what's that big the biggest cyber firm oh, fire eye um, yeah oh fire eye so that's why i mean supposedly why it's so much better now is that they're like contributing to it so but yeah i've heard it's really good i mean i don't have any problems but i have just under disabled because it's annoying but the other, the other thing we see with those type of things too is like if you um wait like since they're constantly updating their hashes you can go back and use an old sample and they just won't be in their table anymore so you wait like two years and then pull out this old malware and they're not detected anymore yep so oh no way yeah, it comes in handy when you're making like um, with Metasploit payloads. It's like, yeah, if, I, if I'm having trouble, I'll boot up a, an old copy of college oh, like, from like two years ago and then encrypt it, you know, that way. And then it won't get flagged because they're like, oh, who's going to use a four year old piece of, uh, you know, software to encrypt anything? A lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some guy in India who picked up a laptop. Yeah. That's crazy. That's crazy. Okay. A few more minutes. Patty. Me? Take us Not on. much. Just uh, I've just been doing some SQL stuff actually at work, uh, setting up Windows clustering. A lot more Windows stuff in my world. And set up a VMware server for our new um, Firefile Threat Defense firewalls. And um, set up the Firepower, th um, Firepower Threat Defense Manager to manage all three firewalls, one and all corporate office to an L data center, set it up in HA, HA pair, got all that configured. And then now the last thing is like when you set up, you guys know about Windows clustering, how that works. Mm. So and if you don't, James, but so like if you had- Break it down. So technically the Microsoft where you have three different networks, right? You have your production network that's connected to your Active Directory and then you have your iSCSI network. If you want to tra traverse that traffic through iSCSI, through SAN, et cetera, then you have your clustering network, which you have your cluster traffic. So when you have, then you have a listener, then you have a witness. So in our case, we're going to be pointing that witness instead of to an iSquizzy share, we're going to be pointing that to Azure. So we download the key, we put that uh, witness in our on our SQL on our on our nodes, and then that's how it communicates to the cloud. And that's how you know pretty much. It's a very simple process. It's it, it's people overcomplicate. I was reading stuff online. Clustering is is very simple. It's a, it's a role in 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 Microsoft um, Server Manager. You hit fellow cluster next next. You pick your two nodes and it's a wrap. It's done. Ten minutes you have a cluster. And then um, and th the next thing is we have to s install SQL 2019 on top of that. And then it gets out of my then that goes to the developers and the SQL people because that's not my but as long as the witness and all that stuff is is communicating, and um, when we turn off when we turn off um, node one, you know we so uh, I skipped a little thing. What do we have? Another minute. So when you when you set up the cluster, you have your IP for your host, and you have an actual cluster IP that traverses between both nodes, right? So it's just like HSRP in the Cisco world or VRP. You have your virtual IP. And you have your two routers and your virtual IP. And if router one goes down, this is still your gateway, right? Same concept, same pretty much as if you know the Cisco world. So it's pretty much the same thing. So we tested on Friday. We turned off node one, everything fell over to node two, and we're able to still communicate to SQL cluster one.abc.com. And that's pretty much where we're at. Now, tomorrow, when we go in, we'll set up the SQL stuff and then move over some databases from prod to dev and then test that. And then I think by what is it today, um, hopefully before Thanksgiving, we can move these two servers from dev to production in Miami. So that's pretty much what we're, um, that's what, what I've been up to. Nothing new, basic <laughs> stuff. <laughs> basic stuff. Yeah. 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 Just All right, man, so I think it's under a minute. Uh, so, Hopefully next week we have some more stuff from in here. I want to try to go skate. I want, I want to see him here and try to get this up. What is it, Pop Show? What the hell is a zero flip? A zero flip? I don't know. Zero. I heard, but we'll talk about that in the chat. But yeah. That's the, the trick I invented. Zero flip. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just sit here and I'm fucking not doing zero shit. <laughs> right, yeah. That's a zero flip. <laughs> the slacker flip. <laughs> All right, guys. So we'll link up on the chat. And good seeing you guys. And until next time. Good seeing you guys. Thank you. Ciao. Later. Later. Yeah.